Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. In uh, this episode, it's going to be more about podcasts. Uh, on my website, I've probably got 40 or 50 podcasts that I've done, basically the links to the podcast. So uh, in the description area of this particular YouTube video, when you look down at the descriptions, uh, I'm going to have a link to the portion of my website that will take you right to all of the different podcasts. So you can scroll down through them, pick out the podcasts if if you want to listen to a podcast. Some are audio, strictly audio and some are, some are video as well. So uh, I, there's both kinds on there. Uh, but there's a lot of podcasts, a lot of different topics. Got a Cribs video on there. Uh, uh, I, Exodus Outdoors did that one. That one's pretty unique. Uh, Got one with uh, Greg Godfrey and Ernie on my minivan. I've been getting emails from people and talking to people that have been hunting for quite a few years and they're just finding out about my per particular information on hunting public lands and knock on doors for free permission properties and they want to know more but it's hard to just cold turkey go out and find all the podcasts a person has done. So it's pretty simple when you go on my website. The majority of the podcasts that I've done are on there with a link. You just click on the link and it takes you right to that particular podcast. Some of them, like I'm Wired to Hunt, um, a couple other podcast sites where they've got multiple, you know, where they've done hundreds and hundreds of podcasts. Um, you may have to search through the podcast's titles to find the ones with me in it. Um, Meat Eater... A wired hunt is one of those. Uh, there's a, there's a couple other ones too. Um, one of the interesting ones I did with Dan Infall in conjunction with Dan on scent control. I find that that one to be very very interesting because scent control interesting as hell. Back 10 15 years ago when I started talking about scent control and not paying attention to wind. I had so many naysayers, it was unbelievable. I mean, I was fighting all the time, but um, anymore, I get very, very few naysayers because I've got way too many testimonials from people that have, are paying zero attention to the wind anymore. It's it's all boils down to how bad do you want to ha not have to pay attention to wind. Uh, if you are a passionate hunter, a dedicated hunter, uh, you have the desire, um, you know, not pay, Getting to the point where you don't pay attention to the wind anymore is a huge, huge deal. Um, and nobody in this industry can say that that would not be a big deal. Being able to not pay attention to wind direction, hunt whatever location needs to be hunted on that particular day, at that particular time, morning, evening, pre-rut, rut, early season, whatever. Uh, huge deal. Game changer. So uh, at some point I'm going to put out uh, in the next probably two months, I'm going to put out a three, two or three part series on, on scent control. I haven't touched that category yet on my YouTube videos, but I'm going to. But anyway, uh, bear with me and uh, if you want to see some pictures of some of the deer I've shot over the years, and again, everything I've done has been on public land or free knock on doors for permission properties or free walk on properties. I've never paid on any place in my life. Uh, never hunted a relative's properly, never owned any land of my own, never hunted over a food plot. I've never seen, ever, have I seen public land where there was food plots. So that would be a neat trick. But uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy what uh, you might look at and read or listen to or watch on a uh, podcast. I think there's a lot of really good information on there that would possibly help help a lot of you guys that are hunting public land in heavily pressured area. Um, I'm also in the description area of this YouTube video. I'm going to have a link to the home page of my website. So if you just want to look at the podcast, click on the link to the podcasts. But on my website, I have testimonials. I quit put, putting testimonials on my website probably 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, I've got probably a couple of thousand of them, people that don't pay attention to wind anymore, you know, people that have read my books and helped them kill deer, and people on saddle stuff, just all kinds of stuff. And I've got them from so many years ago. I got a lot of them that are actually written and 
on paper and mailed to me in an envelope. Um, but the ones that when I started doing, they started emailing to me, they're on the website as well. I also have uh, several testimonials from the, uh, the man that ran the Pope and Young Club, uh, Joe Bell for quite a few years, uh, Mike Avery from uh, uh, Avery Outdoors, Tom Nelson from American Archer, uh, Greg Susselman, who was the owner of uh, Sentlock when they, you know, he's the guy that brought Sentlock to the marketplace, Dan Schmidt, uh, editor of Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine for years and years. They put testimonials on my, on my site as well. A couple other ones, I can't remember who all they were. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a lot of testimonials. I've got a lot of photos on my website of bucks that I've shot. I quit putting those on a few years ago as well. Um, but uh, anyway, also on my website, there's a page where you can purchase my books. Uh, I've written three books, co-authored them with my son, Chris, who is deceased. Um, I've produced some instructional DVDs. Uh, the DVDs are 100% instructional. They're seasonal. So you got a postseason scouting DVD, it's two hours long. You got a preseason scouting and location prep DVD, it's two hours long. The postseason one also has prep, prep, look, prep gear on it and uh, location prep. And then I've got a, a, a video three of that three part series is in season hunting and hunting techniques and, and in season scouting if your plan's not uh, coming to fruition. So uh, on the website, I've got a lot of other general information, all the information you need to know about my Eberhardt Whitetail workshops, you know, what they're about, how much they cost. I filmed uh, five of the bucks that I have in my house. Um, the other, I think I got 68 deer heads uh, hanging up at Jay's Sporting Goods in Clare, Michigan. Um, and my three bucks that I shot last year, I don't have any pictures or anything of those that are on this video. It's just basically to walk you through, look at the bucks, bring up a little close-ups of them on an 8x10 color photo of the actual kill itself. But I, I also wanted to uh, let you guys know, for the last probably 40 years, every time I've shot a decent buck, I've written an, I've written an article about it. Some of them have been in bow hunters, some have been in deer and deer hunting. Uh, all of them have been in a regional magazine in Michigan, and uh, they're pretty long. The ones in the, that I end up putting in the Michigan Magazine are very long. They're extremely detail oriented. Some of them are, you know, three, four thousand, three, four thousand words, which is twice the size of a normal article in a, in a like a bow hunter or a deer and deer hunting magazine. But they're very detailed. They have a lot of instruction, and I try to describe every aspect of the hunt: why I did this, why I didn't do that, um, why this particular procedure, why morning, why evening, just. There's just a lot of subtle instruction in there that I think you guys could take away from these articles, but they're written. So um, I kind of would like it if you guys would reply under this YouTube video right here as to if you'd like to see those printed on my Facebook page. I have a Facebook page and it's called the uh, Eberhardt's Saddle Hunting Pressured Whitetails. And I had put some articles on there a while ago, a few, but I probably got 70 or 80 uh, kill articles. And um, so if you'd like me to print those along with pictures of the particular animal or what I use to, to take the animal or rattling or whatever, um, just reply below and then uh, I'll start printing those. I'll probably print, I'll probably post one every other week if you guys want me to do that. Um, it'll last for probably at least two, two years, three years. Um, so, uh, but I think you can take a lot out of them. My articles are not like anybody else's articles. I'm extremely detail oriented. I talk about scent, saddles, trees, how high, just everything to do with, with a kill. And uh, if you're interested, please, please um, reply below that you are. And uh, if there's enough replies and responses, I'll start posting those on my Eberhardt's Saddle Hunting Pressured Whitetails Facebook page. Ten point, clean ten point. Uh, was a state record. 
think you'd be hard pressed to find a buck with any heavier mass than that. Curries all the way out to the end of the beam on both sides. These are some of my other bucks that I have up at a sporting goods store in Michigan. Very unique buck. Battle tested. I was actually bummed when I shot that deer because it was all busted up, but uh, once I got him mounted, he looks really cool. He really sticks out amongst the others. It's big 10. Big public land 12 in December. Two days after gun season ended. Nice 10. Reason he's on the decoy is because he was taken and the coyotes got him on a bad shot. I waited the next day and the coyotes had got him, so I put the rack on a decoy and took a picture. Wide 10. Nice buck in Michigan. Another nice Michigan 10. Another wide Michigan 10. Relatively wide Kansas 10. Michigan 10. <laughs> Michigan 8 point from 1969. My first big buck. Michigan 10. Most of these have been Michigan thus far. Coyote I called in. Iowa 12 on a freelance hunt. Went in the woods, found a primary scrape area, jumped in a tree, shot him that afternoon. Uh, this is that massive buck that I showed you on the wall. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a buck that heavy any place. That is a massive deer other than an enclosure, which they don't count uh, or alter managed property with minerals thrown at them. This is a public land deer. Uh, that one was shot with a muzzle loader, however. There's another one. That one was taken off of an island. He had to cross a river. Big eight. I think it was a nine, actually. There's a G4 on that left side. It's an Ohio 10 point. Late December, several days after the gun season ended. That's a picture of him. Literally two seconds before I let the arrow fly. I'm flatted to turn his head and make him stop. He stopped and when he turned his head, the camera flashed. There was a camera on the tree next to me. Michigan 14, another massive, massive buck, big palmations. I think nine point. Another big nine point. Shot him in that uh, vertigo pattern. 
Got a skyline background, so I used vertigo that day. Another Michigan. This one's awesome. That was my most difficult deer I've ever hunted. Had to cross a muddy, muddy ditch with waders, which I'm coming back across the ditch with him. It's another nine point, big wide nine point. It's a pike, not a muskie, that is a pike. It's a state record deer. My biggest Michigan buck. There's a picture of, at the time, what was the three state record deer. Picture of a 10 point with, 8 point with four brows making him a 10. Throw in a couple weird pictures up here. That's a bow kill turkey. A buck from the 1970s. 8 point. Back in the day, that buck there would have won a county buck pole even during gun season even though that's an archery kill that's a monster buck for the 70s and 80s you don't get you didn't kill bucks back then like you have now because nobody used to pass on anything everybody shot anything that was legal there's another one smaller one older older buck older picture another nice eight And that one, while it's not a monster, it was, I think, 126 or 7. Netted out. Um, it's one I shot in 2005. I wanted one week that year. It was the year I was producing my DVDs, and I worked on them from January 1 through the end of December. So I hunted one one week, uh, shot that with a bow, because all the other guys were taken off for gun season. I went out of state and bow hunted and shot that one. It's another nice one. It's a big eight. It's one from the early 70s. That's my daughter who's now 40 some years old. It's a little eight point, which was a prize for its day. It's 11 point. Again, it was a prize for its day. The biggest buck I knew of that was shot with a bow that year in the whole county. Another eight point. Big wide buck. Another freelance buck right there. Ten point. Just went in cold turkey. Found a scrape area. Shot that buck. Shot most of my bucks over scrape areas. Primary scrape areas. Bobcat that I called in. Taken a few years ago. Nice buck. That was a nine point. Eleven point. That's a hundred and five inch rack, two hundred and twenty pound dress deer from central Michigan, five and a half years old. That's all the rack he got. There's some several pictures. I just sort of collaged. Point from 19, I think 1993. Big eight point. Another eight point from muzzleloader in the 70s. Another collage of pictures. Big eight point. Had to wear waders to get him. Big ten point. Shot him on opening day. Bow season. Big ten right on the edge of a cattail marsh. Eleven point. Shot him back in. Uh, December, shot him in December, snow on the ground when I shot him, when I took the picture, I had driven an hour and a half and there wasn't any snow on the ground where I took the picture, but uh, 
That was a mid-December kill in Michigan. It's another collage of pictures. Eight, nine, eleven, small eight. And that's a picture of one of my early, early ten points. That was an absolute monster stud in a day. And that was just a three-year-old northern Michigan. So, December buck. Another buck from the 70s. Big A point. I hope you enjoy what uh, you might look at and read or listen to or watch on a uh, podcast. I think there's a lot of really good information on there that would possibly help help a lot of you guys that are hunting public land in heavily pressured areas. And, uh, and thank you for watching. And if you like, please su hit subscribe. Thank you.